So thank you all for joining us. Um, we're gonna do our second webinar and this will be our final webinar for the Scientists and Parks Fellows. Um, today's inside the head of an SIP mentor. Um, so I'm gonna introduce myself real quick. My name is Jessica Johnston. I'm an education programs coordinator with the Ecological Society of America. And I also have my colleague here with me. Jesse, you wanna say hi? Hi, everybody. My name is Jesse Rivera. I am a Society Programs Coordinator at Ecological Society of America. Okay, so before we get into the nitty gritty of the information part of the webinar, I just want to do some basic housekeeping rules. Um, so please keep your mic muted at all times unless we call upon you to ask you to unmute your mic. Uh, there's a lot of people on and they could get a little crazy too fast. Um, you're welcome to post comments during the conversation if you have an idea or a question or you like want to say, yes, I like that person's question, you're welcome to do so anytime throughout the presentation. It's highly encouraged. Jesse is here specifically to monitor the chat. So we understand that the chat's going to be buzzing by pretty quickly. But um, I'm also going to ask my mentors, if you see anything that sticks out that is, speaks directly to your project, please feel free to, to respond. Um, if you want to do a verbal question, because we know some people don't have great Wi-Fi or internet, and you might have called in today, and it's kind of hard to type on your phone, um, just raise your participant hand. So if you click on the participants list, you can raise your hand, and then we'll call on you to unmute so you can ask your question verbally. And we are recording this event today, um, so that if you miss anything, or for some reason you have to leave early, we will send out the video link to all the people who registered so that you can go back and watch it at any time. Okay, so this is what's on the agenda for today. Uh, we're gonna talk about the SIP fellows program details, the eligibility requirements, what the benefits are of participating in this program, what is the direct hire authority or DHA, uh, and then we're gonna let the mentors do a little talking about themselves and their projects um, we'll talk about application tips, and obviously the Q&A is at the end, but like I said, if you think of a question, you can ask it, and if anybody's out there that's a mentor or Jesse can help answer it, we'll try to get ahead of these questions, because I know there's so many good ones out there. So what is the Scientists in Parks program? It's a large program that affords young students and recent graduates opportunities to work in a national parks and gain experience. Um, there's different facets of the Scientists in Parks program, but we're only gonna talk about one today, and that's the Scientists in Parks Fellows program. Reason being is because if you see my little background says ESA, Jesse's background says ESA, we're the partners of the Scientists in Parks Fellows program. So it's the only program that we handle, um, and so therefore we only really wanna talk about this one today. What is ESA? What is our role in the Scientists in the Parks program? Well, if you're unfamiliar with ESA, we're a nonprofit organization. We're one of the oldest ecologist-based organizations. We have over 100 years of experience. We host conferences. We have publications. Uh, and we also do other intern programs like the SEEDS program. We also are a partner with USGS. Um, our role specifically in the Scientists in Parks Fellows program, we promote the program. So if you had your uh, PI or your mentor or your teacher forward you information about this that probably came from us. Uh, we do uh, websites and applications. So the SIPESA.org slash scientists and parks fellows is our website. Um, and we do professional webinars and development like this. And um, you, if you get selected, if you're lucky enough to get selected for the program, you become an ESA employee. So it's kind of a little convoluted, but you work in a national parks, your mentor would be a national parks employee, but you would actually be employed with ESA during your internship. Okay, so what is the purpose of the program? I kind of touched on this a little bit, but this, so national parks is an extreme amount of land and territory that these people have to manage. And in order to meet the needs of these natural resource management issues, we are doing the Scientists in Parks program internship. Uh, the idea is that we provide interns with a meaningful natural resource management experience uh, that you can add to your resume, but we also wanna foster that lifelong connection to the national parks and improve any career potentials you may have with the federal service. And um, lastly, but in my opinion, not least, because I value this, this 
particular bullet point the most, we want to increase the diversity in the natural resource ranks of the National Park Service. Um, so we have 15 spots this year. Um, that's more than we usually do. Okay, thanks, Kirk, for the high five. Um, so we have spots all the way from Guam, Alaska, California, Maryland, no, I'm sorry, Virginia, um, Christian said uh, Virgin Islands. So pretty much all across the country, um, but there's only 15 positions. A lot of people ask if this is a highly competitive position. How many people are in the room right now, Jesse? Does anybody know? 64. 64. So if you can imagine there's 64 here today, but I think I had over 150 people registered to come. So yes, this is a very competitive position. You wanna put your best foot forward. I'm gonna talk about the eligibility requirements. I'm gonna go through this really fast. And then if you have more questions, you can add them to the chat and we can try to, to help you understand it a little bit better. But the basic thing is one, we are requiring people to be fully vaccinated against COVID-19 in order to uh, participate in this internship. That is because there are several partners involved. There's a lot of transportation and we just feel it's the safest way to proceed. Uh, you have to be a U.S. citizen or a U U.S. legal permanent resident, meaning you're a green card holder. We don't sponsor students for visas, unfortunately. Um, if uh, So, like, let's look at this through two lenses. You have to be either an upper, upper level undergrad student. So let's talk about what undergrad means, right? So you're either a junior or you're a senior. Um, if you're a junior, that means you have to be a junior by the close of the application period in just under two weeks. Um, I don't necessarily know how you define junior. I, it's how your university defines junior. So some universities define it by a number of credits, some define it by number of semesters. Um, so just as long as your university recognizes you as a junior, so will we, because we do it based off your transcripts. Um, if you're a senior and you're applying, you can't uh, graduate before the end of your internship. That means if it's you're graduating in May 2022 and your internship starts in May, you're not going to be eligible for the program. But if you graduate, say, August 2022 or August or December 2022, you probably would still be eligible. You just need to make sure that you do not actually graduate before the last day of your internship program. Okay, now that's how undergrads would qualify. Now, if you're a grad student, there's a couple different ways. One is we understand that some people like take a gap year and then they're applying to go into grad school starting fall 2022. If you can prove to me that you have been accepted into grad school by the start of your internship, then you are eligible for the program. Um, so if you graduate and then you're not taking classes in the summer, but you're gonna definitely be in grad school for fall 2022 and you can prove that to me, you're eligible. Or if you're currently enrolled in grad school right now. so. Um, the, the same thing applies to the seniors as it does to the grad students. You cannot graduate before the end of your internship. So if you have like a spring graduation date, um, but you're like, I can take one more thesis credit or whatever your institution calls it so that you can actually do this program, then that's what you should do. But like if you graduate beforehand, you're not going to be eligible. Okay, I went through that kind of quickly. So Think about what I just said, and then if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. Jesse will try her best to help you, okay? Um, got more people coming in. Okay, so there's some really fantastic benefits to this program. Um, this year, uh, actually, that's a, it's a typo, but it's full-time work, so that means 40-ish hours a week. Sometimes weeks go a little heavier on one side than the other, so that's something to be mindful of but you have to do it for 12 weeks and you get paid at 640 a week, not 650 a week. So that's, a, that's an error on our part, sorry about that. Um, I think it breaks down to 16 bucks an hour if you're doing a 40 hour week, which is pretty solid considering um, minimum wage cross country. We do, do, we do housing and travel stipends. So I think about 50% of our um, parks are providing housing this go round. Um, the rest of it will be covered by us as the program administrators. We will work with the person who selected to find the appropriate housing, and we will rely on our mentors as the area experts to help us find that housing. Um, you get to obtain on the ground experience while working in, in a beautiful, amazing place. Um, you're going to build an incredible network of professionals. Um, you get to explore 
your career options really. And you really get a strong mentorship experience because you're working with people who are gonna expect more from you than probably anybody you've ever worked for. Um, and that's a good thing. The idea is to push you so that you have a tremendous amount of growth. How do you know which places have housing? Um, it'll say it on the project descriptions on the website. So it'll say housing provided, no, or housing the intern needs to find housing. So I'm just gonna help you find the housing. You, if you were to be selected, you wouldn't be on your own. I would help you find housing. Jesse would help you find housing. One of these mentors would help you have, find housing. Um, and the travel expenses, you know, we do cover the travel expenses within reason, right? So like if you're getting hired in Florida and you live in California, we're probably going to prefer that you fly unless you are required to have a car. And then we'll figure that out, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, and then the last thing is that you get eligibility for the direct hire authority, or we call it DHA. So what is the direct hire authority? Um, it's basically, if you complete the program, you get all the way through it successfully, and your mentor says, great job, you did everything you were supposed to do, then you earn the DHA status, the Direct Hire Authority status. Um, it's good from the day that you graduate. So you have to go back to school and finish, right? Because in order to be eligible for this program, you have to be a current student. So from the day you graduate, for two years, you get DHA status. And that means that you basically get your name on a list that's in a database that's only accessible from internal NPS employees. And the idea is that when a hiring manager says, I have a position I wanna fill, they create a project description, and then they can go to this list and they can seek people who might meet their qualifications. So instead of having to apply on USA Jobs, and if you've never applied on USA Jobs, and you don't really know how rigorous and strenuous it can be, but it is kind of a pain in the butt, um, this is a nice way to kind of skip past that step. Okay, um, and so you're not competing with the, the general public for a job, you're just competing with, competing with anybody who has DHA status, which is a lot less people. All right, I've talked enough. So if there are questions, I would encourage you to kind of write those down in the chat now about the program details, the eligibility, excuse me, and the benefits. But I'm gonna move forward as fast as I can so that we can get to the real reason why we're here, it's to like talk to the mentors, and kind of learn a little bit about them. So I've got three fantastic mentors that are here today, and I'm going to let each of them introduce themselves, uh, talk about where they work right now, and talk a little bit about the project that they are advertising for. Um, I see the start date question. I'll just say that it depends. So you need to look at the start dates on each of the project descriptions to understand whether or not they start in May and June, and that's because uh, a lot of these can be field-based and sometimes, you know, it's still winter in Alaska <laughs> or something like that. So, um, but okay, so let's, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can see each other better. And maybe, Kirk, do you want to introduce yourself first? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Jessica. Hi, everyone. Great to have you here. I'm Kirk Acharya. I'm the plant biologist at Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore in beautiful northern Michigan. Um, I actually was an SIP fellow myself, so I'm excited to have come full circle here and be able to talk to you all and share a little bit about our program. Um, so this summer, as part of the SIP fellows, we're looking for a GIS assistant, so someone that has a good technical background in GIS. And they'll be working with the vegetation division at the Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore to help us with a prioritization of where to do restoration and work on invasive species work within the National Lakeshore. And so we're located about three and a half, four hours from both Detroit and Chicago. And so this is a very big hub for folks to be able to access nature, enjoy Lake Michigan, and also all of the really awesome natural resources we have in the Lakeshore. And so this position is really crucial for us in terms of how we're planning to allocate a lot of our staff time and some of those restoration uh, projects that we're doing. So it's really important for us to have someone who is really passionate, excited about it, um, who wants to be able to learn independently and be part of a really great team. And as Jessica said, definitely someone who is pushing for diversity and inclusivity within uh, not only the National Park Service, but the entire ecological and environmental fields. Thank you. Awesome, thanks. So yeah, that's Kirk. 
Um, he's the Sleeping Bear Dunes Lakeshore mentor. Um, so if you were to go to the ESA website and look at the 15 positions that are listed, he's, he's the guy for that one. Uh, questions should always be directed to the SIP fellows at ESA.org. Jesse, do you mind dropping that email in the chat box um, if you have further questions that don't get addressed today? Um, but yeah, Kirk has got a great project. It's definitely GIS focused. Um, and we could talk a little bit more about what makes a good qualification in terms of that versus what doesn't a little bit later. But for right now, I'm going to let maybe Melanie, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Melanie Flammy, and I um, work for the National Park Service out of sort of a regional hub in Fairbanks, Alaska, which is in the interior of the state. So I work for Yukon Charlie Rivers National Preserve and Gates of the Arctic National Park and Preserve, but we have people who sit at many parks um, and two long-term monitoring networks in our office. So what's nice is that whoever gets to work there can be exposed to a lot of different people with, that do different kinds of science or outreach, any kind of discipline. And also they may have a chance to, um, maybe if there's time to squeeze it in in the tight internship, um, to uh, experience some other parks. And um, so I've been mentoring a lot of different young people for many years, and I always learn a lot from you guys. Um, and so for the fellow, it, it is correct what Jessica said, that the expectation will be a little higher. And we'll need someone who's going to be able to just hit the ground running because our project is um, based on small mammals in Denali National Park, which is about 120 miles away from Fairbanks. Um, we're going to be doing some field work to do live trapping, and we have a long-term monitoring program on small mammals. And then uh, the isotope project in the laboratory will be to look at um, overwinter survival stuff that's helping um, a graduate student and some other long-term research that's happening in the park. So we're gonna look at some diet for small mammals and we're gonna answer some questions about stress in the population. And that relates to the management question. Um, they're building a road from, uh, it's called the Ambler Mining Road and it's crossing gates of the Arctic National Preserve. So that's that precedent setting, uh, setting and that's the management issue that we're addressing. We're trying to get baseline information on those small mammal samples that we collected prior to road development. So hopefully uh, if you're interested in the project, you'll be <laughs> uh, willing to work really hard because we're gonna have to squeeze a lot in in the 12 weeks, so. Thanks, Melanie. Yeah, Melanie's got a really cool project out of Alaska, but it is a very niche type project. Um, if you have had a chance to read through it, you know, you have to be honest with yourself, you know, like, can you really do some backcountry stuff in grizzly territory? But we're going to talk a little bit more about qualifications and how you can like suss that out a little bit. Uh, last but not least, let's say hi to Yvonne. Yvonne, hello. Are you there? <laughs> yes, I am here. <laughs> Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Ivan Bermejo. My pronouns are they, them, and he, him. I am the lead park ranger for the Shark Valley District here at Everglades National Park in Southern Florida. And so for my project, what I'm looking for is I'm looking for a candidate, a intern who will be disseminating as well as relating climate change information that is impacting the Miami area of Southern Florida, as well as the Everglades ecosystem in a culturally relevant way. Uh, meaning that you will be tasked with creating programs, outlines, talks, conversation, uh, activities uh, that will directly interact with the community of Southern Florida. So to give you an example, one of the partnerships that we do have is with the Lotus Home, which is a Yvonne, I lost your sound for a second. I heard Lotus Home, that was the last thing. Here. I can hear you again. There you go. I, oh gosh, this happened last time. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, if you want to go off to another folk, I will hop onto the work laptop and I will, hopefully with that, does not happen. Okay, that sounds good. That's fine. Um, yeah, so one of the things that you'll learn if you get selected and get to work in a park is that just because you are on a national park doesn't mean you have great internet service, right? So um, 
a couple of the mentors have already had their challenges getting connected today. So I saw a couple of questions, but um, I think I'm gonna answer just one that says, oh, so if we don't get to your questions today, you can email me that the fellows, uh, at, at the fellows email that Jesse shared, okay? Um, there is an FAQs page on our website. Jesse, if you can find the link for that, that would be fantastic and drop it in. Um, so that kind of addresses el eligibility, housing, general questions I've seen that have come in over the years. Um, but let's, um, and then as far as the question from the student from India, it really just depends on whether or not you are, um, in fact, a U.S. citizen or uh, you have that permanent legal resident card, the green card. So, um, you know, it's not, uh, there's lots of people that can do dual citizenship depending on your country. So I don't necessarily know your situation, but that's something to keep in mind. Okay. Um, so I had a ton of questions that came in when, um, when you all were registering, but I didn't know if there was any questions that have come along so far that we didn't address. I see a driver's license question. So um, it says, do you, it, like, if you, don't, if you say you don't have a driver's license right now, but you're gonna have one, um, if the if the advertisement says that you're required to have a driver's license, then you know you have to get the one, you have to get the driver's license, right? But there's also some additional requirements, like when you go to fill out the application, you'll start to know you'll start to see like it has like a little checkbox qualification check checkbox, and it'll say like you're required to have a car or transportation. Um, so Yvonne, I don't know if Yvonne got back on. Explain why you would need a car uh, for your scenario. Sure. So, uh, apologize. <laughs> Apologies, everybody, for that uh, uh, that technical difficulty. But uh, for here out in Everglades National Park, uh, although we are in Southern Florida, a very uh, dense area, very populated location, Everglades National Park itself is a 1.5 million acre park. We are located in the Shark Valley District, which is in a northern section of the park. Uh, the closest area to Shark Valley within the population is going to be uh, towards the Tamiami region, and that's about 32 miles. There is no public transportation system that operates to Shark Valley, unfortunately. So, you know, if you wanted to get to work, to, to sign into our offices, to access the resources that the park has, you do need a personal vehicle to be able to get there. So even our park housing that we are, are going to be able to offer to our intern, uh, it's within nine miles of the office area. So you would you know, be walking nine miles or bicycling nine miles. And if you've never been to Southern Florida during that time period, it is our wet season. So we do have a lot of hurricanes, high heat and mosquitoes. So it is not a pleasant experience if you do not have your own personal vehicle to get to work. So we highly recommend, and it is a requirement to have that personal vehicle. Thanks, Yvonne. Yeah, so, you know, we don't like creating barriers. We know that not all students have cars and that sort of thing, but, you know, wh whether or not you can obtain a driver's license beforehand, uh, that that's great, but you have to be wary of this when you're looking through the projects. Like, will you actually have transportation that you can take with you as well? That's like a big factor. I want to talk a little bit about backcountry. Um, because Melanie's got kind of a really cool project, but Melanie, do you mind kind of explaining a little more about what backcountry experience means? Sure, yeah. So what backcountry experience means is that we're gonna be out in the field and in a lot of the locations um, that we work, access to services, um, visitor services or um, emergency services is, it takes days to get that help. So uh, we're going to be in Denali doing field work, but even then uh, we're a mile and a half in from services and we've had people in the past who've been injured and stuff. And it's really hard um, for uh, like EMTs to get in there and help you if they have to take you out on a stretcher and a mile and a half on a moose trail, right? So um, in backcountry in Alaska, not to sound like, oh, it's Alaska's different thing, because I know people get tired of that, but it really is different. 
from the years of experience I've had where we've had young people who've come up from the lower 48 and other places and they've been out in the backcountry, it's a different ball of wax because, because things are so big, it's so remote and it's expensive to get help. So um, it's just uh, something, and we are working with wildlife. We've got moose, we've got bears. There's a lot of real experiences that we've had where we've been charged by moose or bears. And that's just something you've got to um, be aware of in your mind. So, but we're there with you. We can do it. I just want you to be realistic about it. I don't want to scare you away. <laughs> Thanks, Melanie. Yeah, so I think the point we're driving home today with the mentors is kind of pointing out some, some potential obstacles and also some potential desirable experiences, right? So like, obviously, you want to meet that moose, right? But do you? Like, I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, and it's really important that you understand the difference between having baseline hiking experience in the Appalachian Trail versus living in backcountry for a week plus at a time in grizzly territory. So, you know, understanding your capabilities versus like what the potential project is actually asking of you. Um, not to say that you couldn't gain that experience, just just be realistic with yourself when you're applying to these positions because they are very, very competitive. Okay, so Kirk has a very heavy GIS um, project. And Kirk, what would you say in terms of qualifications? Because everybody's like, well, I'm, I'm gonna take GIS this semester and I don't wanna be a gatekeeper or anything here, but do you think that that's realistic for what you're asking for? Yeah, good question. So I think it's really great of you to want to gain these skills, and I'm glad that folks are thinking about that pre pro preemptively. Um, but for this fellowship program, we're really looking for someone who already has had at least one or two GIS courses, and they're really comfortable navigating around um, what that software looks like and even doing some pretty basic coding themselves. Um, in the park, they'll definitely have support from our biologists as well as our GIS tech when that person starts on in the park. Um, but really looking for someone who can kind of hit the ground running this summer, take the information that we have and, and work with us to come up with something that can inform what kind of restoration happens along um, the really awesome dunes and forests that include this national park. That's a great question. And I'm happy to talk more on that if folks have specific questions. Thanks, Kurt. Yeah, so um, let's let's just talk about kind of the website for a second here, right? So when you go to the website, there's um, available positions, right? And then you go there and you see a table and there's 15 positions and then it says apply now and you can click on each one and then it'll tell you the eligibility requirements again, because we want to make sure you're eligible before you even go down the rabbit hole. And then there's that project description. In NPS talk, they just call it a PD. Um, so it's really important that you know that PD forwards and backwards um, and that you can really let your, your qualifications shine uh, in your application. So how does that shine? It has to shine in your essay responses. It has to shine in your resume or CV. Um, and you have to be honest with yourself because if I'm looking at 100 of these, right, because the cap is 100 per project, um, it's going to be very obvious who's extremely qualified versus who is not so qualified as they would like to admit, right? And it's really important that you take time on these essay question responses so that you can use the words that you have available. I think the word cap is like 250 or 300, I can't remember. But every word should reflect how you are specifically qualified for the position, okay? So I'm going to start asking um, or asking the questions that were on the registration sheet. But if you feel as though there's a question that hasn't been addressed, uh, go ahead and ask it. Oh, wait. Is there places to get prescription medications filled in backcountry? Uh, Melanie, do you want to answer that real quick? Uh, well, the answer would be no. Uh, in the backcountry backcountry and when we go out we're out for at least a week sometimes we're out for longer but for this project it'll be um, maybe two weeks I, I have to look at the timing but um, yeah so you have to get that stuff taken care of in, in town before you go out that's a good question 
I have another one that's kind of like, and this is for all three of you, but like, what are the hours like for a normal day? Um, and the, like, is there such thing as a normal day in the NPS? I don't know. Um, so I think you're all gonna have very different responses probably, right? So that's something to keep in mind. Um, Melanie is talking about backcountry for two weeks. So maybe snapshot of like how many hours per day you think that would happen, like how that would work out for you real quick. And then maybe Kirk and sure. on. Yeah, the, so the field work, it, we're doing small mammal monitoring and we've been doing it for almost 30 years. So I got this down pretty good. So um, at first and last days would be uh, about 12 hours. And then depending on how many animals, the population cycle, if it's a high or a low, um, your days can be kind of regular eight hour days with a lot of breaks between trap checks, or you can be slammed <laughs> working, um, you know, 14 hour days to keep up with it all. So, um, but we try to take good care of you. We make sure you got lots of chocolate and breaks and, um, and we work great as a team. So not to scare you away, but it really depends on the biology of the animals. Yeah, so luckily with plants and computers, they don't get up and run away and you can't get more of them in a trap in a day. So uh, as far as working in the vegetation division, sleeping bear, it'll be a pretty standard work week um, that you would find in most positions uh, outside of field work. So eight to four, nine to five, uh, Monday through Friday. Yeah, for, for mine over here, it'll be very similar where you'll be expected to work eight hour days. Uh, the big thing for us is that part of the project, your responsibility and job is to do community outreach and engagement. So obviously we cannot have you be working from just nine to five because a lot of folks, we want to make this accessible to them as possible. So they are also going to be working during that time. Uh, so there will be moments where you'll be expected to work from 12 to 8, from 2 to 10, uh, Saturdays and Sundays as well to do programs with some of our local organizations at some of the public libraries here in the Miami area. Uh, so the schedule will fluctuate. Uh, but the nice thing is, is that it offers some flexibility for us. And so that whoever I do hire as an intern, uh, uh, them and I will be closely communicating just to see and ensure that you're not going over those 40 hours. If you have anything that's coming up or if you have any specific days you would like to have as loo days, known as weekends in the National Park Service area, we can work to accommodate those as well for the uh, Everglades project. Yeah, so in a nutshell, it depends, right? <laughs> so that's where we're coming back to those PDs, those project descriptions. It's really important that you kind of read through them very carefully uh, so you can draw some conclusions from that. So if you see the words backcountry, you're not going to have uh, your like nine to fiver position, right? And then if you see things like community outreach, you have to expect that those hours are going to extend because if you're only going during work hours, how much are you really participating with the community if they're all at work, right? So things to think about. So you might have to do some weekends or some evenings or something like that. I have a question related to housing. What does housing typically look like and what kind of experience um, can be used to really stand out? Uh, especially for education programs. So Yvonne, do you have any, or is, is your park providing housing? What's that like? <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> I, uh, we here at Everglades National Park, we do have park housing available. Uh, you will have park housing. Uh, an example for us is it is a uh, bungalow kind of style where it is a uh, two bedroom, two bathroom house. Uh, there is the potential uh, of whether or not that you may have a roommate who would be another intern working in Everglades National Park or in Big Cypress National Preserve, which is another NPS unit uh, located in sharing borders along with Everglades. Uh, for our park housing, the big thing that we prepare our seasonals for, so our uh, NPS employees when they come out here is for us, you are located down Highway 41 in the Miami area. So you are about 30 miles away from any grocery stores or anything like that. Uh, the housing unit does have AC because it would be absolutely cruel to throw you into a Miami summer with no ACs. Uh, however, there is no de dehumidifier. The big thing is when I was staying in park housing when I first arrived here to Everglades, uh, 
for those two months that I was living there, I never felt like there was a moment where I was dry. There was always some sheen of moisture on me due to the high humidity of Southern Florida. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, some of the other things as well is that there is no Wi-Fi located within the park housing and there is some spotty cell service. So it just depends on the carrier that you would have. Uh, so one of the big things we recommend for folks is that as a source of entertainment is to, to bring anything that you feel like you would need to uh, occupy yourself, entertain yourself during those off hours. Uh, but the big thing for us here at Everglades is we do really much value a strong sense of community. Uh, so there are going to be, uh, depending especially how the pandemic plays out during that time, is, you know, community events. We'll have luncheons with other staff members. You have the opportunity to make friends uh, and uh create some social bonds with some of your coworkers here in the Shark Valley District. So that's definitely something we're going to play a part in the park housing situation at Everglades. Thanks, Yvonne. Yeah, so, that, and that's kind of common. Uh, the If you do find parks that don't necessarily require transportation, but they recommend that you have a license in a car, the reason they're doing that is because they're far from a grocery store, right? Or they are not right off a of public transportation line. Because these are typically spots that, you know, they're meant to be pristine and protected. So they are kind of tucked away from the major metropolitans. Um, there is uh, now Alaska's project um, with Melanie, the housing is not included, but we can figure out housing together. And Melanie, I've already talked about this, but Melanie, you want to talk about dry housing real quick? Sure. So and one of the reasons you need a car also is because of the housing. So we don't have a bunkhouse, unfortunately. And a lot of the housing that's affordable here, it's pretty expensive. The cost of living are dry cabins. And that means they have an outhouse. They don't have an indoor plumbing. They don't have a, a toilet inside. Um, there's a little building outside that's a you know little outhouse for you. And then um, they don't have um, like a sink or anything. Well, they may have a sink, but usually you have to haul your own water um, in five gallon jugs for the sink. Sometimes they have may have a small tank, like a hundred gallon tank or something. And um, and so if you're not used to that experience, um, it can be kind of a shock. <laughs> So we just want to, just like Yvonne, we want to make you aware of some of the challenges. It's super fun. A lot of people do love the cabin lifestyle. A lot of the, the students up at UAF, our local university, stay in cabins. So it's, it's um, you know, not an undoable thing. And I don't want to discourage you. I just don't want to shock you. <laughs> I want you to be aware of it. And a lot of those cabins are, you know, a couple miles away um, from town. And so just like Yvonne was saying, it would be arduous to like ride your bike if you didn't have a car to go get groceries and, and to get back to your cabin on a bike, right? So it's not impossible, but it would be a lot of work for you. So it's just easier to have a car. We do require a driver's license too, because we may need you to help us drive some government vehicles when we're doing our field work and stuff. So. Thanks. You know, it's funny, Melanie, because your project sounds so cool to me, but when you're talking about it, it's also like kind of scary, you know, <laughs> but really cool, mostly really cool. Um, okay, so Jesse just dropped a question that was asked in the registration. So what type of jobs do participants get after completing this program? I couldn't think of a more perfect person to answer this question than Kirk. <laughs> You get to become a plant biologist in the National Park Service. Um, yeah, so I was a fellow just two summers ago now in graduate school. Um, and I, I had the good fortune of really connecting with my mentor and still stay in good touch with them on almost a monthly basis. And um, they really helped me through the process. And I was lucky enough to happen upon this position. Um, yeah, and it's a it's a great way to kind of dip your toes into what working in the National Park Service is like, but also getting to really apply what you're learning in either your undergraduate or graduate coursework um, in a really interesting way that you get to see inside of the heads of, of biologists or, or um, National Park Service interpreters that are thinking about how they can connect with both the ecology and the community around them for the park. There's not just federal position. I mean, like you don't just have to become a federal position. I will say though, um, in my, as the program administrator for the past couple of years, um, in my eyes, Yvonne was also a past intern. Um, so Yvonne and Kirk are the perfect 
close to my ideal loop, right? So this is that DHA, that direct hire authority, right? So when you come out of this program, you have that status, that ability to like kind of get back into the MPS. So if you're like coming to this program and to feel out the waters to see whether or not federal service is right for you, it's the perfect program for that. Just keep in mind that from the program administrator's perspective, like that's what we want. We want you to come back to, to the MPS. Uh, but that being said, you know, there's other, other career paths. I mean, even if you don't get into NPS, you might get into U.S. Fish and Wildlife or USGS because you've already gotten a taste of that, that federal service. Um, there's a follow-up question about publishing papers as a result of this experience. Um, Kirk, did you ever publish no. stuff with Scott? Okay. Melanie, no, have you ever published? No, it was published internally, but that's definitely an option for folks yeah. to pursue. Yeah, I'm just wondering if anybody had like, so I would say um, I did have a student from the same cohort as Kirk, uh, Daniel, and he actually did publish. And my one of my interns from last summer has just published with her mentor as well. So one of the things I will say about publishing is uh, keep in mind that you're, you're now committing your work beyond your pay, right? So like you get paid for 12 weeks with ESA and then anything beyond that is your own self-motivation, you know? Um, but if you were to go through that with your mentor, I'm sure that mentor will go to bat for you for any position you want, you know, because it's not easy to publish and it requires a lot of mental effort. Um, so something to keep in mind. Okay. I do have a question that I saw and um, it's related to resumes and CVs, like what's an appropriate length? So if I were to give you all an application, um, how do you... Like, what do you want to see in terms of length of resume? Or is there any, any sort of structure or anything that stands out to you? And anybody can answer this question. Yvonne, you unmuted first. You go first. <laughs> sure. So I, um, we hired here at Everglades National Park, we hired uh, two seasonals along with one permanent park ranger employee. And so I was reviewing our resumes for that. We had three positions open. I looked at about 128 resumes. It was a lot of resumes that I had to go through to hire for those positions. Some people's resumes ranged only from about two to three pages in length. Others, the longest resume that I had was about 22 pages in length. Um, so they can vary very drastically. One of the things that I do recommend for folks when completing a uh, resume for this position, it's not something you have to do, but something that is nice is if you've never participated in USA Jobs, if you've never looked at any of those applications or anything like that, I recommend you go on to usajobs.gov. That's where any and all federal job postings are. If you were to create a profile with USA Jobs, you can use their resume builder and it helps you create a resume. When people are applying to federal jobs, that's typically the most common format they're going to be applying with. So it gives you a sense or idea as to what is considered standard for uh, some federal workers and employees. If people are applying with that template from usajobs.gov, I know exactly where all the information is located in that resume. And if I need to see something, if I want to check, you know, compare two different applications and they're both using that template, I can do so pretty lightning fast and lightning quick. Uh, because realistically, when I had 126 applications, I was only spending about three, maybe five minutes max per uh, resume, giving them a score and then ranking them together to sort of uh, get through everybody. Uh, it would be great to have more time to do so, but when you just have that large volume, I just unfortunately do not have the time in my day to spend 20, 15 minutes looking at every single person's application. So that's definitely something I'd recommend is if you are not familiar with USA Jobs uh, template, go ahead and visit it, give itself a look. If it's something you like, you can do. You are not required to do that, nor is it like uh, strongly recommended for my position or anything like that. But it, it's nice because it's a familiar format that I have already had tons of experience looking at for other positions. Yeah, I see this question come up a lot. Kirk, do you have something you want to contribute? Well, yeah, I'm just going to build off that. I'm sure Melanie will agree with this too. I think when you're applying for positions in the park service and the federal government wide, a good rule is go for first the depth and kind of quality of your work and then think about expanding that to all your different experiences. Um, so one of my best pieces of advice from a past mentor was don't necessarily just bullet point what you've done, actually write out in kind of more a 
organized fashion, the kind of work that you've done with more specifics and and maybe how you contributed to the goals of that organization and that past uh, experience that you've had. Yeah, that's great. I, I would agree. And I think um, it's tricky, but if you can try to tailor your resume for the job description, the position description or PD, that helps. You know, you're not only thinking about uh, the person that's going to be hiring you, but sometimes these federal positions get scored by people in the administrative offices too. And so they need to be able to find the information easily. And if they're wading through something that isn't formated, formatted well or something that's not familiar, like Yvonne said, it's going to take them more time to find the information. They might miss it. So you might not score as well. So those are just great thoughts to keep in mind. Yeah, so I do a lot of the application filtering myself before I start kicking the top qualified candidates over to Melanie and Kirk and Yvonne, but that's because I've had intimate conversations with each of them about what they're looking for in a qualified candidate. Um, and I would say that the number one mistake is that people will, will select that they're qualified for something. So they'll say like they have GIS skills. And then I'll look at their resume and their essay responses and there's nothing about the fact that they actually have GIS skills. There's nothing that points to their experience. Um, so that's that's one of the crucial things that will kind of not get you in that top candidate list, right? Don't say that you have those qualifications. And then if you have GIS experience, and, and we've had this conversation multiple times now about how Kirk was a very qualified GIS candidate, talk about the types of um, analyses you've done with GIS specifically on your resume or within your ES or your essay response. So it's it's like clear as day that you're qualified without question, right? Um, and you know, it's okay that if you're like uh, say stronger on the GIS side but a little weaker on the ecology side, then play to your strengths, right? So like don't sit there and hyper focus on the fact that you don't have this technical skill. Focus on the fact that you have these other technical skills. And make sure you spend a lot of time making it very obvious for, for me and anybody who's reviewing your applications to know that. Because um, if we have to spend a lot of time drawing conclusions and thinking that you're qualified, then you're probably not. And, or you've done a poor job of selling yourself. And you know that's a skill that you have to learn with time. Um, and there's a lot of fantastic federal resume YouTube videos out there. I'm a big YouTuber. I like, when I'm bored and I want to learn how to like, grow a garden. I watch like 17 YouTube videos. Okay. So like, if that's, if you're, if that's how you learn, I, I would highly recommend just doing it. Um, but you know, also reading the comments and seeing the validity, right? So that if you are going to go down the YouTube rabbit hole, you don't end up taking bad advice, right? So anybody who formerly worked for the, for the federal government usually has a good grasp on how to make federal resumes. Um, you know, or any like education-based programs similar to this one. Um, I think I might even have a federal resume one. If you went to the ESA's uh, YouTube channel and like looked at the SIP playlist, you might find one. But I'm just driving this information home because I have it, I have seen two two ways of it. Right? There's the overinflation of your skill set, where you're saying. I have all these skills. And then you put on your resume that you've only like volunteer here and you've taken two classes and you've had, and so you're not really convincing me you have those skills. Um, and then the other side of that is I only have four of these six skills. Um, but then I look at your resume and you say you have this experience, this experience, and this experience. And so I, I just want to make sure that they align, right? So that when I'm looking at it across the board, it's consistent. Don't undersell yourself just as much as you shouldn't oversell yourself. And I'm talking to the ladies out there because I know you girls like to do that. <laughs> I've particularly seen women in the past <laughs> specifically undersell themselves. And I'm like, why are you doing that? Um, so yeah, is there a date we can expect to hear back? So let's talk about timeline, right? Um, that's a good question. And the, this is actually helpful for the mentors because I don't even think they know this. <laughs> um, so the applications close on the 23rd and then I've got about two to three weeks to sort through a thousand applications, I would say. It's a lot. It's a lot of applications, right? Some parks are really popular, some not so much. Um, but then I kick those top qualified candidates over, 
for them to review and feel out who they want to interview and who they think is the right person for them. Um, sometimes that takes a week and they know right away. Sometimes it takes three weeks. So I would say five to six weeks after the close of the applications is when you would finally get whether or not you've been um, like offered the position. But like if you haven't heard a, probably within a month to five weeks after the close of applications, that probably means that you're um, not going to be a top qualified candidate. I wouldn't give up hope though, because, you know, say I send five candidates over to Kirk, like I might send him 50, but he's got five on, on his, like he's really into these five people and he interviews three of them. And then uh, he didn't really like the one interview and then the other two decided they wanted to go with something else. He's going to go for those other two people. So don't give up hope. I'm just saying like, that's kind of the general timeline. And the reason we like do the offer week, I think it's somewhere around the second week of March. Um, it might even be March 8th. I think that that date is popping in my mind for a specific reason. But um, we do that offer week because we need six to eight weeks to get you in the system. We got to do background checks because we're trying to give you access to all of the MPS world while you're there, you know, so that you can really build your network and, and make the most of it. Um, and that takes a lot of time and it takes even longer with COVID. So uh, something to keep in mind. Okay, are there any unanswered questions? Jesse, do you see any questions on the registration list? I see one that just came up. Okay, so this is specifically about essays, more formally or more style of cover letter, or should they be more creative and personal? Um, so I'm gonna answer this one and then Kirk and Yvonne and Melanie, you can chime in after I talk if you don't mind. I'm the one that sees them the, for the most part right now. Um, so I will say that uh, you only have a set amount of words and I'm not necessarily looking for styles per se as I am looking for, are you backing up what you've said in the qualifications list above, right? So if you said like, I have backcountry experience and be like, I've been hiking and I'm certified at this and I've done this and I've done that. Like I, I would prefer not to be bulleted because I want to see, I mean, some of these projects are really asking you to write like technical writing reports. Um, so it would be nice to see you do it in an essay format and not a bulleted list. Uh, as far as the creativity thing goes, um, I, I will leave that to you. I've never not included somebody because they've been creative. I've not included people because they were focused on being creative more than they were on actually showcasing their skills, though, if that makes sense. So, like, uh, the number one mistake, I would say, or is that everybody says, I love the national parks. Ever since I was, went to Grand Canyon for the first time when I was 12 years old, and it's like, it's a beautiful, heartwarming story, but it has nothing to do with the actual project. Like, do you actually have the technical skills? Please tell me about that. So like, and there's so many people who love the national parks. Like, I love the national parks. <laughs> like, the people that work for the national parks, I think for the most part, love the national parks. So that was something to keep in mind. Does any, do any of the mentors want to bounce off of that or, Melanie? Yeah, I'll chime in there. I Yes, I agree. I think um, because we might have, you know, poor you, it might have a thousand of these to read through. Um, it is great to, you know, want to express your excitement about stuff, but I think really showcasing the skills and backing up, you know, your um, experiences with what's listed in the PD is really what we're all kind of zeroing in on and like she said you have character limits so yeah just uh, highlight you you know showcase you and be creative in that way but tell us what you what you can do awesome yeah thanks uh we'll be okay i got jesse she's gonna help me um okay so i guess the advice does it apply to sciences and parks uh interns um well we, i told you we we're only gonna talk about fellows but I will say, probably, uh, I'm not the program administrator there, so I don't, I'm not the one that ever views the applications, and I don't think that their process is exactly the same as ours, but I will say that you're still going to be seeing mentors that are just like Kirk, Melanie, and Yvonne here, right? And they all had to go through the same hiring process. They all had to do the federal resume. They all had to be very concise and specific about their technical abilities, 
um, while also maintaining like uh, good communication and correct verbal and gra grammatical written things. So um, it's a good practice, right? Like if, if you're interested, you have to ask yourself, why are you so interested in this internship? You know, is it because you really like national parks? And if it's because you really like national parks and you want to work with for the national parks, then you need to start building your skill set and 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 learning how to create those federal resumes so that you can see your your vision to fruition. You know, um, and and that's kind of like an inner question there, right? Uh, not to get all sappy, but like you got to really kind of figure that part out. Well, oh, it's like if you've already submitted an application, would you suggest that we go back and resubmit a new resume with the USA Jobs template? Ugh. I never not put somebody through because they didn't have a federal resume format. So, no, I don't. I'm sorry. I don't want to like. I don't want to change. Like, you're not supposed to edit your applications once they're done and it wouldn't be fair if I said yes on this thing and then anybody who didn't come to this thing wouldn't be able to do that. That being said, I want you to know I would never not put you in a top candidate list because you didn't have a federal resume form. That is not something that I look for. What I look for is whether or not you are backing up the skills that you said that you have, right? So if you submitted a resume that said, uh, I have great multitasking skills and then you were a server, I would believe that because I know servers have to have great multitasking skills, right? But if you submitted a, a resume and said, I have great multitasking skills and I, uh, or you check the box of the GIS box, but then you didn't say GIS anything on your entire resume, mm, that's not a good sign. That's not a good sign. What other questions you all have? We're, we're down to the wire. We have a couple minutes left. So I don't want to, you know, cut you off. You can end somewhere. So if you're on the jobs application, um, there should be an apply now button, right? On your jobs list. If you're not seeing that, um, yeah, and Jesse just dropped the available positions. If you're not seeing the apply now button, it should be everywhere, all over the website. It might have like an older version of your in, cached in your browser. So you might need to like clear your browsing data or um, open a different browser. Like if you use Chrome, use Mozilla, see if you get a different result. But the apply now button should be everywhere on the website. I think it's like there's 20 apply button, apply now buttons. Okay, woo. I got some thank yous. Was there a question that I missed? Yeah, Caroline Ford said, if I meet all of the qualifications for one park and all of the qualifications for two others, is it worth the effort to apply for all three parks? Yeah. I mean, so like Kirk is looking for that beautiful GIS person who has ecology background, but at the same time, and I just keep using Kirk because his face is literally right next to mine in the little panel. But um, if, if you... Uh, if you have like great GIS skills and then for some reason, like there's just nobody out there that has ecology background but has phenomenal GIS skills, guess what? Like you almost didn't apply to that because you were afraid to check that ecology box, right? Don't do that to yourself. Don't sell, your, that's what I'm talking about, selling yourself short. Don't do that. Don't do that. Just make sure that you're really genuinely qualified for those boxes that you're checking, you know? And then uh, if you're not checking the backcountry box, like, you're not going to get me. I'm sorry. But that's like, I'm just trying to make sure people stay alive for that one. <laughs> you know, like, so that's just something to keep in mind. Or the bilingual box, right? So like Yvonne's communities are very heavily influenced by, you know, Spanish culture. And you have to be able to connect with those people genuinely. So if you can't speak to them, how are they ever going to truly trust you or, or even know, know where you're, you know, where you're coming from and what is the message you're trying to send to them? All Sorry right. to jump in here, Jessica. I unfortunately have to jump off for another meeting, but I want to say thank you very much to all of you for joining. And Yvonne and Melanie, it was great to see you both. And I look forward to seeing some awesome applicants. Thank you all. Thanks, Craig. Thanks, Kurt. Yeah, we're, we're down to the wire. So uh, we're going to wrap it up. Um, I will say uh, if you 
have more questions that were specifically not addressed today, you can send me an email at the SIP at ESA, SIP fellows at ESA.org. Jesse, if you could drop that in the chat again. Um, and, you know, understand where you are and where you want to go. This program's not going anywhere. I saw there was a question about three different programs. Um, so just know that like the three different programs have three different eligibility requirements and they all have different positions. So if you wanna learn more about the other two parts of the Scientists in the Parks program, just, just go to their websites. I mean, if you were to do a Google Scientists in the Parks program, um, it will take you to the main NPS website. And then the NPS website has a table with three different websites in it. One of those is the fellows. So that's the, that's us, that's ESA. The other two are managed by two other completely different organizations. It can be a little confusing. So just, just read up on it. You can, you can apply to all three, assuming you're, you're, you're eligible for all of them. Okay. But that's just, they're all closed on the 23rd of this month. So manage your time appropriately and don't rush through those, those uh, applications because that, that's going to be very telling in terms of your performance, okay? Um, all right, I think we're going to wrap it up. I wish I could get to all the questions. I try my best every time, but you all just come with such so many interesting and amazing questions. Um, I want to thank Yvonne, Melanie, and of course Kirk, even though he's already gone, for joining us today and taking time out of their very, very busy schedule, because I know they're busy. Um, but, and I want to thank all of you. I really hope to see some of your faces again, you know, and if you don't get in this year, don't just, just recognize how you can improve, even if it's not for this part of the program, but maybe you apply for a different part of the program because the eligibility requirements are different, you know, just keep pursuing your dreams. You'll get there. I promise. There's lots of you, but if you, if you work hard, it will, it will show. It will show. Okay. Thanks to all of you. Melanie, Yvonne, if you have two minutes, hang back with me just real quick. But if you don't, I understand. Um, but that's it. Take yeah, care. Thank you all. Thank you all. Hopefully I'll see some of y'all's names in the application polls in the future. Thanks, guys. Good luck, everybody.